Every time I do a Star Wars video, I seem to have a different setup. Oh well, let's crack on with today's video. Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith is a 2005 American epic space opera film written and directed by George Lucas. It stars Ewan McGregor, Natalie Portman, Hayden Christian, Ian McDermott, Samuel L. Jackson, Christopher Lee, Anthony Daniels, Kenny Baker and Frank Oz. It is the final instalment in the Star Wars prequel trilogy, the third chapter in the Skywalker saga and the sixth Star Wars film to be released overall. The film is set three years after the Attack of the Clones and towards the end of the Clone Wars. After Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi take out Count Dooku, the Council dispatch Obi-Wan Kenobi to take out General Grievous while leaving Anakin Skywalker to spy on the Chancellor, who is actually manipulating Anakin for his own needs while converting him into legendary Darth Vader. Upon release, the film actually received quite positive reviews, especially for its action sequences, themes, score and visual effects but there was a lot of criticism towards its dialogue and Christensen performance. So what could have made the film better? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. 10 things that can make Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, better. Number 10, too much CGI. Now I actually said this for both the previous films, that this film is abundance of CGI and it is dated, it dated very quickly. It still gives that impression it is a computer game. I, this is half the reason why I'm not a fan of CGI. As much as I love Star Wars, CGI is a bane of a cinema. It should be used in conjunction with practical effects. Try and do as much as you can with practical effects and then just enhance it with CGI. Not do the entire film on CGI like this film was. And yeah, some of the times it's just so bad, it's unbelievable. Number nine, bad guy. So in Phantom Menace, we actually had Darth Maul. He was awesome, he was cool, he was brilliant, and they killed him off. So in Attack of the Clones, we get Jango Fett, a non-Jedi. He was a bounty hunter who could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Jedis. He was also cool, he was fantastic, and they killed him off. So who do we get for Revenge of the Sith? Well, we got General Grievous. No, sorry, he's nothing compared to the other two. He walks around. How can you take a guy <coughs> does that every five seconds seriously? I don't actually like this bad guy. Also, he was just purely CGI. Oh, no, he was just awful. He wasn't memorable. He wasn't cool. He was awful. He is the worst secondary bad guy in the entire franchise. Number eight. No, I'll probably get shot if I didn't actually include this in this video. But one of the worst things in this film is after Anakin's become Darth Vader, he steps out of that table thing and goes, No! Really? This is going to be the most sinister bad guy in cinematic history, and that's how you actually introduce him. Oh, granted, he's not introduced, but this is his origin story. No! No, I don't even have the words to say. Do anything else, but you have just ridiculed and just oh, ruined Darth Vader with that scene, that no. That's all I can say. No to that. Just do anything else bar that. Number seven, Palpatine. Now, re-watching this film for the umpteenth time, but this time actually seriously analysing it for this video, I've actually come to a conclusion, especially as I've done Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones already in this series, is Palpatine was actually right. His main goal, which he set out in the Phantom Menace, was that there was too much corruption, there was too much not for the people in the Phantom Menace. He said that in the first film, and he reached his goal. Annoyingly, Palpatine is right. He is actually, if you look at it, a good guy. He's actually doing what's best for the galaxy by ruining democracy, stop all the squabbling, and just say, right, we're going to do this to improve things. It ruins, especially how he was introduced in Return of the Jedi, where he was an out, through and through, bad guy. He was just pure evil. But you don't actually, when you actually sit and watch and analyse the prequel trilogy, he's not. He's actually doing a good thing. Maybe he's doing it in the wrong way, but ultimately he is doing a good thing. Yeah, I'm not happy with that at all. I feel sick just saying it. 
Number six, Jedi. So on the polar opposite, yes, in this film, you actually are showing the Jedi as bad guys. The Jedi are actually going against the elected official. Now, granted, it was all part of the ultra convoluted plan of Palpatine, but still, you've actually portrayed the Jedi as the villains. They are the bad guys of this film. <sighs> Same again, I feel ill about saying this, but it's true. They should have followed protocol, gone to the proper people saying, right, this is Palpatine, blah, blah, blah. The stupid thing is, as I've said in the previous entry, Palpatine was right. No one would have done everything. They would have said, yes, okay, yes, he may be a Sith Lord, but he's doing good. Why? <clears throat> no, you've just ruined the Jedi. Number five, droids' heads. This film introduced these droids that can actually stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jedi. Ultimately, they still lose, but you actually get that impression they are a bit of a threat, they are that little bit of a danger. Ultimately, you know the Jedi are going to win. But when they are fighting, Obi-Wan actually takes one of these droids' heads off, it carries on fighting, and you actually get in the back of your mind, ooh, that's interesting, which is cool. I actually like that, 10 out of 10 for that. But then later on in the film, when Obi-Wan's about to go after General Grievous, he drops something on the droids, one of them still scrambling around, he chops his head off, it's dead. Huh? You have just contradicted what happened earlier in the film. That was cool. Now you've just ruined it. That doesn't make sense whatsoever. If you were going to do that, put a different type of droid in. But you just ruined the awesome droids that were in this film. Number four. Friendship. So in this film, Anakin has three major friends. Three people who all love and adore Anakin for various different reasons. You have Palpatine, Obi-Wan, and his wife, Padme. So great, friendships mean everything, except for not to Anakin. Because he actually turns, at one point, on all three of these films. Yes, including the Chancellor, and I'll start with him. When Anakin finds out that the Chancellor is actually the Sith Lord, he doesn't give his friend the chance to explain. He just runs off and grasses him up. No friend would do that. Even if you knew it was illegal and you knew it was wrong, you'd give your friend that chance to explain and just, you know, talk you around. Even though ultimately you're going to grasp them up or it's wrong, but you would still listen and give them that opportunity. And Anakin doesn't. Which makes it even funnier when he goes back to Palpatine when he realises Palpatine was right. Obi-Wan Kenobi. When Obi-Wan went off to fight General Grievous, the next time Anakin and Obi-Wan saw each other was on Mustafa. Same again, their friendship, which has been shown to be a brilliant friendship at the beginning of this film, it's gone, there's no existence, there's no, you know, come on, we, we can sort this out, we're going to fight, we're going to kill each other. Sorry, this is improving that Anakin is a poor friend, and makes it worse, his wife. Any marriage is based on friendship. I love my missus, we're not married, but I do, she's my friend as well. So what does Anakin do to his wife? Does he listen to her? Does he give her a chance to explain? No, he says she's wrong, he doesn't listen to her, and then attempts to kill her. If Anakin Skywalker is your friend, run away. Whatever happened to Jar Jar Binks? Number three, why Anakin turned? If you've only ever watched the film, you think, well, yeah, I can understand why Anakin turned. But unfortunately, I have also read the book. Oh, by the way, Jamie Simons, can I have my Revenge of the Sith book back, please? Anyway, back to the video. I've read the book, I read the book about two weeks before the film was released in the cinemas. And one thing I loved about the book was it so in depth on why Anakin turned. Reading the book, you sort of understood, you actually understood his mindset, you understood his conflict, the internal conflict of what is right, what he should do, people pulling from each side. It was brilliant, but all of that was lost in the film. It's very generic, it's very, it's just this one part. There isn't that inner turmoil as, there's some, but there's not as much as there is in the book. Now granted, in books you can go a lot more in depth and do Anakin's inner monologue, but you should have tried to portray that in this film a lot better, or maybe that was just down to the poor acting. You decide. Number two, Anakin's eyes. Now one of the most coolest scenes in this entire film is just after Anakin kills all the separatists. He turns, he looks at the camera. You can see the pure evil. You can see the eyes have changed as well. And it is an awesome shot. 
So much so I'm not showing any clips in Fairy Tale. I'm actually just showing a picture of that because it's that awesome. So why am I putting on the list? But what happened to these eyes? One, why did they change in the first place? Now the theory is, it's all that power, which I would understand and I probably would accept, except the next time you see his eyes, just before he attacks Obi-Wan and while he's talking to his wife, his eyes are normal. All throughout the fight with Obi-Wan Kenobi, his eyes are normal. And then as he's actually being burnt alive, his eyes have changed back. Why? If you're gonna do that, I mean, this is what I would have done and I would never have picked this up because it would have been cool. Leave his eyes, the rest of the film, as this. But no, you didn't. You actually had to change him back to normal and it sort of ruined this fantastic looking scene. Number one, high ground. By now, everybody knows what happens at the end of the fight between Obi-Wan and Anakin. Anakin's up on a hill, he shouts to Anakin saying, don't try it, I've got the high ground. Anakin jumps over, that's it, fight over. So why am I putting this on this list? Well, go back to the Phantom Menace because this is exactly how Obi-Wan killed Darth Maul. Exactly, except Darth Maul had the high ground, Obi-Wan jumped over and killed Darth Maul. What? It either works one way or works the other way. Why didn't Obi-Wan die in the Phantom Menace, apart from that we've had the rest of the films, or why didn't Anakin actually do something, or actually still show Anakin having the high grounds, Obi-Wan being on the low grounds, because it would have been a nice callback, but you just reversed what happens in the Phantom Menace. Really? Final thoughts. Now, this film is not perfect. It's a good film, but it's not perfect. And I have said some of the main points that I think, or my favorite things that can improve this film, there are some others like the pacing, the timing, but this film did get a lot right. It lowered the amount of politics in this film. It was an acceptable level, brilliant. Thank you for listening to us fans after the criticisms of the first two films. But the one thing this film got right, which it should have got right, is the one thing every Star Wars fan wanted. And that was an awesome fight between Obi-Wan and Anakin. If this film hadn't delivered or failed at that task, this film would have flopped. But luckily it didn't, because let's face it, everything in this film is null and void, because no one actually cared about the rest of it. All we wanted to see was that fight, and oh my god did they deliver. It was brilliant, it was fast paced, it was action packed, it is probably the best lightsaber battle in the entire franchise and John Williams' music once again enhanced it. It was fantastic. I mean I'm more than happy just to go and watch that last half an hour of the film just for that lightsaber battle. That's how good it was because it does sort of put everything else in this film to rest. But the film actually wasn't that bad. It started off on a high with that space battle. Yes, we actually got space battles. We actually had Star Wars that was missing in Attack of the Clones. Then it did the whole politics thing, but it was kept to a minimum and it still kept flowing. It was like moving on, moving it on to the rest of the film, which is what we wanted. We didn't want OTT politics. We actually had Yoda as an absolute badass. This is the most badass Yoda it has been in any Star Wars film. He was brilliant. And watching the Emperor finally turn into the Emperor and how was fantastic. It tied up a lot of the loose threads. Now I know we've had a lot of stuff with uh, books and TV series which I'm ignoring for this franchise, for this series that I'm doing. But ultimately this film is ultimately the best out of the prequel trilogy and it was good, it was well deserved. Now, the acting has dropped slightly compared to Attack of the Clones. Ewan McGregor has improved, but same again, the rest of the cast seem to be rather, you know, chilled, rather laid back and very wooden. Hayden Christensen, I don't think was the right choice for Anakin Skywalker. Natalie Portman, once again, she just looks bored all the way through this film. Well, which was the same, because I said that for The Phantom Menace with her, and she improved dramatically for Attack of the Clones, and then her quality dropped again. And Samuel L. Jackson, even though he is a massive Star Wars fan, same again, he looked rather bored. Uh, but ultimately, story-wise, it was the best out of the tr uh, prequel trilogy, as I've said. So what am I going to rank it? It's still a Star Wars film, it's still good, and because of the final fight, which everybody wanted, and they fully delivered, 
I'm going to give this one 7 out of 10 berries. So there you go, there's those berries. But that's my opinion. What do you think? Do you think I am being too nice on this film? Am I doing, being too harsh on this film? Let me know in the comments below. Or even best, what you will review in the comments below. Or is there anything I've missed out that could have made this film better? You decide in the comments below. Other than that, next week, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do a film that is most excellent. There's your clue, and I'll see you next Sunday, 6 o'clock. Bye-bye.